We Make Movies Film Geeks podcast with the zip. That was fantastic. <laughs> Episode number 77. Welcome to the We Make Movies podcast, making the world a better place, one film at a time. And now, here are your hosts, otherwise known as the director, the actress, and who the hell is that guy? Chad, Michelle, and Garrett. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the We Make Movies Film Geeks podcast. Podcast is all about how to get your movie made, how to get it seen by other people, and how to get it awesome. I'm your host, Garrett Robinson. With me, as always, faithful co-hosts, Chad Kukahiko and Michelle Lucadu. We are all independent filmmakers and members of the We Make Movies filmmaking community in Los Angeles, California. Hi, guys. Hello. Hi. Michelle, Hello. without a doubt, this is the best your you like your whole background, your whole frame has ever looked on the show. This is amazing. Well, thank you. I just moved, so Yay. The, Yay. The new nice bedroom, hardwood floors. It's totally yeah, awesome. Mm -hmm. It's a nice, nice house bed. How's everybody doing? I'm tired Good. and I've spent most of the morning crying. <laughs> <laughs> I stayed up you... all night working on Unsaid, and so, like, I, you know... Oh, I thought it was your time of the month. I thought that yeah, was your Yeah, well, it, it's that, too. <laughs> like, it's a whole trifecta. I'm working on my film, which is a tragedy. I haven't slept, and I'm on my period, so... But, uh, <laughs> no, it's been amazing. It's been fantastic. Wunderbar. Wunderbar. Well, let's get into the show. Uh, all we, right. Uh, yeah, we don't do the news up front anymore. That always throws me every single time. Chad, why don't you launch into your main topic? So, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dive right in on something very interesting. I feel that sometimes I, I, it's like there are paradigm shifts that, that happen in the world and people don't even notice. For instance, ever since I read Chris Anderson's book, The Long Tail, I see what he described in that book um, – is is actually changing everything all around us every day now. Kids and kids and teenagers seem to recognize uh, the changes in the world around us because they haven't actually experienced a different kind of world. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, you got to read the long tail. Uh, it's basically it it just deals with how we are now a niche based culture instead of a hit based culture. And most of us who are, you know, 30 and and up, ha you know, grew up in a world in which. We were in. We were a hit-based culture, and everything's changed. And anyway, when I when I look around, I'm I'm always shocked to see that that though the you know, kids are getting it, they don't even they don't even get that much has changed. You know what I mean? It's just like, oh, that's the way it is. I see that old people, older people, like people my age and whatnot, are still acting or thinking <laughs> older, not old not farts, old, old farts. <laughs> Non above millennials, older than millennials, we're still acting the same way, and we're thinking the same way in, in in a variety of different ways, and we're just not really noticing that the world has changed at all. For instance, uh, the new basic default for everything that we share on websites, um, on social networks, etc. It's all public. Like the default is public. You post something, like if you sign up for Venmo, for instance, to give somebody money. Um, when you give somebody money, like everybody, all your friends on Venmo see it, and they're like, you know, and that's not like that's not typical. But because it's a, I mean, it's not typical prior to whatever uh, right. the past several years. Uh, but see, I, because you know, prior to MySpace and Facebook and Twitter, we just assumed that everything. Uh, all these companies, all these sites and whatever, when we shared stuff with them, it would be private. But then when we started to um, openly share facts and, and photos and videos and whatnot on these various different uh, platforms with everybody, and then eventually the sites and the apps and whatnot, they started to slowly change and started to actually sell that info. And that that's where the majority of Google's and Facebook's billions of dollars in revenue each year come from, our collective information, which they sell. So the new basic default in our lives is now that everything is public. And as people realize that, they start to to kind of freak out, but I think I think most people are kind of missing a very a small but very important point, uh, which is the noise, because now everybody is sharing everything all the time. There's such a massive cacophony of noise that, for the most part, you know. Nobody might as well be sharing anything because there's too much noise, and it's getting you know every all the details are getting swallowed up in it. So you you obviously hear about these rare exceptions to the rule, like the tweet 
that came out from this this basketball uh, this uh, sorry this college baseball player from Philadelphia some like Bloomsburg College or something like that yeah. he got booted from his team because a particularly offensive tweet that he put out about Monet Davis how Disney's doing a show about her and he's like oh that slut blah 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 and so yeah. the tweet went viral so you know people are like oh no you don't want to tweet bad things because it'll go viral and and blow up but that's like to that be fair, i think the lesson there is don't be a dick you know for like, sure it's not like exactly. be afraid of sharing things publicly it's like don't no. be a complete asshole no for sure but my my point is a little bit it's a little bit it's you know, i'll make my point a, a little bit just let me yeah. let me let me finish this because the fact is is that there are 58 million tweets each and every day 50 and and mind you that actually was a statistic from July 2014 so who even knows what it is now and that so that breaks down 50 million tweets per day means that there are 9000 tweets per second you know so if a handful of those 58 million get like a headline in some you know website or whatever the rest of the 57 you know million plus are just basically ignored, you know, and right. you might as well not even be tweeting at all. They might as well be invisible. So, if I'm sharing, and this is some of this is like when I'm I'm sharing like uh, documents. When I a lot of what I uh, what I do when we're sort of organizing for a shoot or whatever is we'll post stuff on Google Docs, and uh, you have to have a specific. I, I'll share it with a specific email address, uh, but I don't honestly I don't see if like the if this if the doc itself is not uh, listed, meaning that like if uh, I tell search engines not to post it, then then how are people going to find it? You know what I mean. So it might as well be it might as well be password protected because there's no way anyone's just going to stumble upon the link. You're not right. going to be able to go to a search engine and search for it. So it's just going to be. So it's. I mean, you might as obviously don't put like your bank information and pin numbers and stuff like that into you know, of stuff that you don't need a password that, that aren't several layers because there are specific bots and, and hackers and stuff out there that are really looking for the low-hanging fruit. But, you know, stuff like, unless you've got like a, a very dangerous hacker, you know, very sort of uh, determined hacker, uh, stalker, you know, no one's going to find It's just no one's going to find it. Yeah, um, yeah. So it's just, I don't know. It just seems to me... I, I know that Europe has a lot of issues with all of the lack of privacy. We were, we've just been kind of selling it. You know what I mean? We don't care. We've been giving it away here in the U.S. And it's not, I don't see a big deal. I've got nothing to hide myself. So it's, I don't know. That's, it might seem like a sort of a rambling kind of idea, but it's, we got to recognize the anonymity that, that the noise uh, actually kind of grants us all. Yeah, I think you it's know. I think it's interesting just because people do freak out about like you know well if if I want to use Facebook then I have to give up all this personal information. It's like yeah, honestly, dude, nobody. What's the gives danger? A, yeah, nobody gives a shit about your personal information. Well, you know. Well, they do. Uh, but what are they going to do? Sell you something you actually might want? You know what I mean? What's the danger? You know what yeah. I mean? It's like. Well, but the, uh, speaking to that point specifically of like uh, of like I share I share information and and I I say the same thing. It's like I I don't care. I have nothing to hide. And people are like, well, it's not about nothing to hide. It's about privacy. Like we have a right to privacy. And it's like you absolutely have a right to privacy. Just just don't use Facebook. Like right. If you want to be so fucking private, then then don't be on the internet. Like that's not the internet is a publicity communicate with other people tool. That's all it's there for. If you want privacy, go go into your room and don't talk to anyone. You know. Right. It's, anyway, I think it's, it's also a little bit about like misrepresentation and and people. Um, I have a, a specific friend on Facebook who it looks like the most successful, wonderful, oh, that's a, yeah, that's thin, a sexy player in the world and like in life. He's like five three and, and balding and very sad and like you know, it's like it's it's uh, there's there's a huge problem with people misrepresenting themselves on social media and then then you know, there's a fallout afterwards. Yeah, so, it, I, yeah, and and that's a whole nother thing where it's like you know the, the the persona that you put out online usually isn't you know completely accurate to your actual life. 
So anyway, but 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 I know people that are that have basically they're like so freaked out about security and whatnot that like they won't like they'll if they're gonna try to sign up for something they only want to have one thing they'll they'll give you you know it's pretty it's pretty hilarious how uh, how super like cautious some people are if it's not your bank information no one's really gonna care trust me yeah exactly. <laughs> All right, well, uh, speaking of paradigm shifts and all that sort of thing, uh, this week I picked up the Amazon Fire Stick that I talked about on our last show. You guys. You guys. You guys. This thing is Fire Stick. <laughs> this thing is <laughs> <laughs> Fire Stick. <laughs> it's a, it's a um, Sounds like a disease. <laughs> <laughs> this thing is awesome. Um, the user interface, first of all, it, it, it works similar to the Chromecast, but the, the, the design is, is very different. Basically... You're broadcasting internet TV to your actual television. It plugs in like a USB stick, but to an HDMI port instead of to a USB port, and it just goes right into your TV. The user interface, really, really awesome. It uh, it comes really? with a remote. Yeah, yeah. That's insane. Oh, yeah. Why I, don't they fix their freaking website? <laughs> well, they were busy developing the Fire Stick. Yeah, because they've been developing the Fire Stick, but they like, can take it back. God. Yeah, Sorry. I know. It's weird. So annoyed by. That. But, um, I'm even a Prime member, and it's like it so annoys me. Yeah, no, but if seriously, if you're a Prime member and you plug that stick into your into your TV and like you know like you have to log in with your Amazon info and everything, but like it, it's weird. Like you can tell they put a lot of time into the user user interface of the Fire Stick because like using the remote is a pleasurable experience. You know what I mean? Like when you get your first <laughs> iPhone or, or smartphone. Seriously. Yeah. It's so like playing with your you like playing with your fire stick? I do. I yeah. I enjoy playing with my fire stick very much. And um and, so and it comes with a remote. It comes with a remote, but you can also control it through an app on your phone because you know you're going to lose the remote at some point. Um, mm -hmm. but uh, but you 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 can do it with an app on your phone. And the app on your phone so cool. And it's also the the app on your phone if you have like an iPhone probably on Android too it's voice controlled so you can go uh you can tap it and go Amazon open Netflix and it opens Netflix what? on your TV I I, but, I mean how is this different from Apple TV it's not uh, I haven't expensive. actually ever used an Apple TV I have um, I have an Apple TV Apple TV Apple TV costs twice as much as the Fire Stick. And it costs twice as much, and it's a box. And it's, you know, you have to buy all your movies through iTunes. This is basically Amazon being like, hey, why don't you buy movies through us? Oh, or you can be an Amazon Prime member, and we give you a shit ton of video for free. Like, I now have, all, all, like, every HBO show. I can finally watch The Wire. Dude. The, the Wire is not on Netflix. The Wire is not you on don't Netflix. Even Wait till my next thing. Wait till, okay. wait till I talk about my next thing. Big, oh, yeah. Big, 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 big news that came no, out. No, no, for sure. But it's um, it's it's really awesome. You can search for and buy uh, or rent movies and films on the TV itself. Like, you just scroll through and all your account info's in there. So it's like, you want this? You want to rent this movie? Just click and it rents it and it plays. Or if you're on your computer or you're on your phone or something like that and you're like, oh, I want to rent that movie, you can click rent and, and rent it through the website and then it's automatically on your TV via the Fire Stick and it's just in your library and you just go and play it. It's a really good device. So instant video, Amazon Instant Video has, in my mind, if they don't fuck up the marketing, if they actually promote it and put the, put the effort into it that they need to to market it as a product... Amazon uh, Instant Video just became a serious contender because they're well, not they need even to take. They need to take that user interface and fix the freaking website user interface for for Prime because it's, right. it's all. Awesome. Hey Chad, how do you feel about Amazon's user interface? <laughs> I don't think he's a fan, <laughs> Michelle. So good, they should. I never heard that. I yeah. mean, maybe you know what? I haven't been in a while because I just gave up on it. It's entirely possible that they've already Im improved it. It's in I don't know, but it is possible. Yeah, well, I just do everything through my stick now. <laughs> yeah, uh, Michelle, why don't you tell us about uh, a documentary you saw? I yeah, it's really interesting. It's called History's Hidden Engine, um, and it's uh, all about like socioeconomics. Um, and it's it's you know, I'm a, I'm one of those girls that read like all the Freakonomics books. I love you know that kind of stuff. Um, but it had an, a section about the film industry, um, and it, it says like it's according to. To um, the documentary, um, the stock market plays like the hugest part in what types of films are popular. Huh. So, like 
every classic horror movie was produced in a bear market, like Dracula, Frankenstein, King Kong, the Mummy, um, all of that. Like, and whenever there was a bear market, like everybody's wanting to watch horror. Um, and when hmm. the Dow Jones was plummeting, people are people are like literally like, let's get creeped out. Um, and when stocks are rising, um, folks watch mostly adventure and like family flicks. Um, and uh. so they have a bunch of examples, but like in 1937, um, they, you know, the best example of family flicks is Disney. Um, so at the top of like, it's like a roaring bull market, Disney like released um, Snow White, its first like animated feature. And it was like Disney film after Disney film after Disney film and everything was really successful until the market topped out in the late 60s and then nothing until the 80s. Just the, all of these like really weird, interesting parallels between like movie mm -hmm. genre and stock market. Like how people, what people want to see. They want to go see like happy stuff when they're losing their money and... Horror. Now, just to be clear, they're not, they're not, they're not, Alec, they're not saying that this correlation is a causation, right? They're just saying that they happen at the same time. They're not saying that the stock market like decides it, right? Which movies yeah, they, come they out? are, yeah, they are saying it is causation. Um, it's people, you know, it. Basically when the economy that it, that it is doing better, better, yeah, not it that like what yeah. type of person, what type of film a person is going to see, thus. Making oh, what type of film type they're in the mood film. for? I get right. it. Okay, making a certain type of film popular. I thought there. I I, I I I for some reason I got the idea of like, huh, the stock market's down. Let's go make a horror movie. Like that was the thought oh. process behind oh, film no. executives. And no, I don't think I mean, people are always audiences, making yeah. audiences are into certain things. And I've yeah, no, I've been hearing that generally, but that's it's cool to hear that somebody really broke it down specifically. That's interesting. Yeah. I've heard I've heard another uh, interesting theory that um, that uh, vampire movies are more popular when uh, Democrats are in power in the government, and <laughs> zombie movies are more uh, are more popular when um, uh, Republicans are in power in the Congress, or vice versa. But it's something to do with like the bloodsuckers who you know, and then the mindless hordes of drones. It's uh, how do you how thing. do you decide who's in charge of the government? Because yeah. so often it's shared. Yeah, but I mean, like when one is like overwhelmingly in power, you know. Uh -huh. I don't know. It's an interesting. I I don't know how much stock I place in that specifically, but it's a, it was a, it was a fun read. Yeah. Anyway. Interesting. Yeah, people's well, moods definitely. Yeah, people's moods and like how they kind of view their life definitely impacts what kind of films they're. Totes. Which is interesting, as filmmakers, like one should take stock of kind of the 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 social temperature, the social climate, if you're going to make something that's going to come out in the in the next year or so before it could potentially change. Right. Um, I mean, it might be something to think about as far as marketing yeah, and for what sure. kind of film you're making. I wouldn't be surprised those... if that's part of what uh, different, you know, uh, investors and financiers do. I, I wouldn't be surprised if that's like oh, yeah. a big part of their uh, their equation. Yeah, completely. Yeah. Completely. And sure that's some kind of ridiculous algorithm like yeah. Right, and to some degree, I'm sure you like it's something you can't predict. Like you come out with a film. What was that? Uh, there's some there's some movie that I, I I can't remember right now, but it came out the week after some major political event happened that directly related to it, and just shot into the stratosphere. And it's just like you couldn't have controlled because they set the release date, you know, six mm -hmm. months in advance, and then a week beforehand. Anyway. Well, Michael Moore's uh, movie that came out right about, I can't remember if it was the 2006, I think it might have been, no, it was right before Carrie's, uh, uh, you know, failed attempt um, mm -hmm. in 2004, uh, Michael Moore put out, and it came out like right at that exact time, and it still didn't really have much of an effect, you know? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah I, think. I remember that, yeah. But it did destroy at the box office. I mean, that's what part, you know, it, it did a lot better than, than people had expected it to. Anyway, I'm going to continue, if I may. Yeah, do it. Um, here's another story that uh, it happened actually while we took our week off. Uh, it was the guilty plea by the producer-director Randall Miller in the um, ill-fated Almond Brothers biopic Midnight Runner trial in Georgia. Uh, that's a mouthful. Um, if you're not familiar with it, this is the case where an assistant camera on 
the indie film was killed on the train tracks um, that the film was shooting on without permission or permits in the state of Georgia. And the state of Georgia then turned around, indicted the producers, the director, and the first AD of manslaughter for the death of the AC, uh, who was named Sarah Jones. Miller's plea, which he, he made a couple of weeks ago, it got him two years in jail, plus another eight years of probation and a $20,000 fine, um, which is actually, believe it or not, is actually pretty notable because this is the first time somebody's actually been, um, you know, even the stuff that had happened back in I think the 80s with Twilight Zone, nobody was indicted. Everybody was acquitted off of that. But mm -hmm. but he he pled guilty. Um, the executive producer and first AD were also found guilty and both sentenced to 10 years probation. Uh, it doesn't sound like they have to serve any time. Uh, I didn't see anything about a fine either. Anyway, that all happened uh, the prior week. Um, so if, you were, if you've already been following this case, you probably already heard about that. But Miller's publicist just released a statement from his side, uh, basically giving, giving his side of the story. Uh, I don't mean to laugh because it's actually really, it's a really sad situation, but it's also kind of, anyway... You, let me tell you what it said. It said uh, that um, he, he basically basically said, "Oh, I only pled guilty because I didn't. I wanted my wife to get who she was uh, one of the producers on the film for her to not have to serve any time or or get anything." And and that's what the plea deal was. Is she was completely basically uh, you know she got off completely, and that's what the plea deal. Uh, did but in his statement he also basically completely shirks responsibility for the incident he's like you know one of those like I know I should have done more but all these other he says and I quote a great number of mistakes were made end quote by his assistants uh, on the crew and you know when you hear all the like the the evidence that obviously it didn't actually make it to trial but that you're hearing about uh, against Miller and the other producers such as an email from the location manager saying very clearly that they do not have permission to shoot on the tracks and then two emails from the company backing that up the company that owns the railroad bridge where the crash happened denying the project permission twice um, and it's a it's just when you see that stuff it's just a little ballsy for this guy to be you know he, who's spearheading this project who is the guy running the thing to, to kind of pass on the res off the responsibility to others you know it's really just kind of but get two years in prison maybe he'll uh, maybe he'll think better of it you know I had a go ahead um, why why the first ad what happened with the first ad it seems like I well, I don't I mean, know I mean the first ad I would think would be like they're the person who's you know uh, theoretically at least in charge of like yeah. running the crew yeah. and also watching out for the crew like they should be the one being like telling the director and the producer we're not doing this if we right. don't have permits you know absolutely like, right but it was just, but like I could imagine being first AD on that and like being in a really difficult position if the producer director is you know, yeah, you for run sure, the set. But... As first AD, you run the set. So if you say we're not doing this, and you it, then you're not doing. So it's I completely like basic like when we did um when we did uh, jam and we got s stuck in that sandstorm. Um, I totally could have shut it down. I was first ADing that production. I could have shut it down. I basically put it on to the producer and the and the and the DP who was worried about his equipment. And I said it's up to you. You tell me. You know, if you don't feel comfortable, then we're shutting down. And so he was like, and so, but I didn't really, I, I should have been looking at, in hindsight, I almost wish I had gone back. I, I almost wish I could go back. If I could go back, I would stop it because the people were in danger. You know, stuff was flying through the air at high speeds and, and whatnot. And, um, you know, and I totally would have, if something bad had happened, I would have taken responsibility. That's the first AD's job. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, anyway... It's Bullshit. pretty. It's it's sad, but I mean, he he reminds me of an old boss who whose name I will not mention. But it's just it's so fascinating. People that want to take all the credit for things when it goes well, but then take zero responsibility for anything that goes bad on set. You know. Yeah. Well, I mean, as tragic as it was, the fact of the matter is, it 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 has opened up a can of worms that should have been opened up a long time ago. And, I think and can of worms is not the word not you're looking for, worms. but yeah. I know I know and what you mean. But it, not, but it opens up a dialogue. Suggestion. Yes, yeah. it, absolutely. Um, no, it's it, because people really. It's been a long time. A lot of sets that yeah. people have been risking a lot on. Yeah, it's, and it's been getting worse. And I hear 
I hear all kinds of horror stories, and it's yeah. it sucks. Yeah, yeah, it does. Um, yeah, I was. I, I'll quickly relate the story. I was on a set of a feature, um, and I it was a it was kind of a racy thing. Um, there were there was a scene where there were a lot of extras that were prostitutes uh, in this scene. I, I was not an extra prostitute, but um, but there were a lot of extras that were prostitutes, like on an indie feature, getting paid n nothing. Right. Um, and at one point, the um, director and the director's wife came on to set, and they were like, um, some of you guys just get needed to take your tops off. We need more skin. <laughs> And, and and continued to stand there and pressure these poor women and, like, individually offer them $50 to take the chops off on this film. They're like, we need more skin. We need more skin. Oh, Jesus. Like, are, are you – really? I mean, like, how many rules are you breaking? This is ridiculous. Right. But, That's I mean, it's probably, it happens all the time. It's just another thing. Like, people think that because they're – I don't know because it's a, an indie. They can do whatever the heck they want, but that sucks. You can't do what you want. You have to do. There's rules. There's things. There's me. All right, I'm gonna move on because I'm depressed. All right. <laughs> I'm gonna move on to something that's actually. Uh, I've been crying all day. I'm gonna move on to something that's actually still a little depressing, but but not really. <laughs> if you don't like the movie Chappie, I want to punch you. Really? Oh my God. I saw it on Friday. I fucking love it. It is saying, "Oh my god, have you have either of you seen it?" I've not seen it cuz I've been afraid of getting depressed cuz I like his first two movies, but he doesn't I don't know if you've read any of the interviews that that Blomkamp gave afterwards. He's like apologizing for it. Really? And it's like, "Yeah, I've been no. I don't been not Do not apologize. Do not apologize, Blomkamp. Better than District 9. It's better than District 9. That's some I bold honestly. words. Yeah. Thirty percent on Rotten Tomatoes. Thirty percent with critics. Know. Critics, yes, but only sixty-four with people. That's not a huge. Well, you, you know what? Sixty-four <laughs> percent of the people are wrong, and thirty-six percent of the people are, are no sixty. You the other way around. around. I'm tired. I, think I haven't the main slept. issue with that is is the is the title. I lit I saw that I don't know what Chappie's about. I don't know anything about Chappie. I don't know. Maybe it's like based on something. Whatever. Oh, but the like, marketing I was saw, terrible. Yeah. It was awful. The, yeah. I, I passed the a, a great book. though. Say again. Well, the preview like, was great thing, though. It's called Chappie, and you're like, what is it? Like a, a remake of Small Wonder? That is what I thought it was. <laughs> well, the preview, the preview was great. The preview is just not the movie great. at all. It's not the movie even a little bit. Like you see the movie. Oh, sorry, you see the trailer and you kind of think, okay, so this is probably some kind of uh, reasonably feel-good movie about a robot like finding sentience and independence and discovering what it means to be a person. That is only what this film is in the loosest possible sense. It's it's really uh, it, it it's extremely dark in some places, uproariously funny. In other places, if you're a parent, there are scenes with this robot that you will feel like you're witnessing child abuse. Because basically this robot becomes sentient but doesn't know anything. And its learning capacity is just through the roof. So it starts learning everything very, 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 very quickly, picking up language and culture and all this sort of thing. But it falls in with these gangsters who want to use it to commit, like, a heist. So they're like, well, we got to toughen him up. So there's scenes where they're just like, toughening up the robot and you're like stop it it's like a baby stop it um it's just really really good there's only like one or two moments in the whole film that i felt were that i felt were a little bit cheesy um which you know whatever but um really solid performances by everybody the graphics on the robot solid it's performances by a Don Antwerp, Di Antwerp as well Yes, dude. Get out. Seriously, no. That's one of those things. They're one of those things where, like, you watch them and you're like, clearly not professional actors, but refreshingly so. You know how every once in a while you can have somebody in a film, and the fact that they're not a professional actor is somewhat refreshing because they don't, they don't, they. It's like they're not trying to act, and therefore they 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 feel very genuine. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like, I feel yeah. like we saw. I I I. They reminded me 
how do I put it? They remind me Kazan like, did that with like one of the leads in Panic of the Streets. It was a guy who'd never acted before, and he was like a he was like a just a regular dude, and like carried it. I mean, you right. know, he wasn't he didn't have a huge amount of charm or or presence or anything, but you felt like you were watching a dude doing shit yeah. in real. You know? I never, I never saw Captain Phillips, but I feel like people said that about the uh, the the Ethiopian actor, like the main pirate. Watches him, all of them. <laughs> like they were yeah. all from that same, like they all grew up, like it, they didn't grow up, but they all lived in like the same subdivision in Minneapolis, apparently. Right, and yeah. but like they're not, they're, they're not big actors. They're not like super yeah. pro awesome actors, but they oh, were yeah. there, and they were like, it was like they were actual Ethiopian pirates. Dude, and, that guy looked really good. The guy, yeah. I, I haven't seen the film, but in the just from the previews, that guy looked good. That and D. Antward, guy. they are the they are the gangsters. They are the you know gangbangers, and like they're running around and and they just they seem like weird counterculture South Africans who just like they're very legitimate and very. Uh, Let me ask you one question though about yeah. it because you haven't really talked about the main problem that a lot of the critics have with it which is that it's all over the place and that it doesn't really like you don't really it doesn't really have sort of a main and you don't really know what's going on just to, pretty much from any from a, at any given moment what what well, do you I, think I I don't think you I don't think you ever don't know what's going on it's not a plot driven movie at all it has a plot that like that that kind of pulls the characters through itself so to speak mm -hmm. but um but there's a lot of moments that are that are just about character, where the characters are just doing a thing, um, and you're learning more about them, and they're having like these intensely emotional interactions, and they have like the it, it's not like the plot. It, it's not a James Bond film. It's not like bam, 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 and then the thing, and then the thing. Like they're all a robot is trying to figure out what the hell it is. And a bunch of other people are trying to figure out what the hell to do with a sentient robot, and they're they're pulling it kind of all over the place. It's like watching it's like watching parents with kids go through a really bad divorce in a lot of places. You know what I mean? Like as a parent, it was sometimes very hard to watch the movie because whoever played Chappie, I I don't know. I looked up the guy's name. The, and I can't remember it. It's the same dude who's always all of his. I recognize his voice right away. The same guy who was the lead in District Nine. Same guy who was the main bad guy in. Is he uh, really? Yeah. Oh yeah, wow. You recognize his voice right away. I yeah, looked him up on IMDb. I didn't recognize his face. That was my problem. So, um, so if anyway. I can just like you know wrap this up, what you're saying, Garrett, is that Chappie doesn't really have a good plot, and it doesn't have some some great actors and I don't I don't think it has a bad there plot. Some kind I just of think subliminal, it has a very... like hypnosis going on on the screen that you walked out and you were like I like Chappie. I like no, I, well, I don't think it has a bad plot. I think it has a very anti-typical plot. I don't think it has bad actors. I think it has actors who are very much not the norm and I don't think it has a bad uh, I don't think it has bad characters. I just think it has characters that people are like you 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 can't pigeonhole the movie. It's not a pigeonholeable movie, and I feel like people just want to be like, oh, well, it's just like AI by Steven Spielberg, but with gang violence. It's not. It's not that. But thematically, you, you, like, but thematically, it is it that that's what the main problem is 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 that thematically it's it's all over the place that's what they're saying that you think you're watching a movie that's about x and then it changes and suddenly you're it's about y and then it's like and it doesn't really settle on something thematically that's what again i haven't seen the film but that's what that's to me that's a big part of what makes a film if anybody is me. criticizing the film because it asks more questions than it answers then jump off a bridge like seriously you know what you know why i know <laughs> i'm going i'm not going Bridge. You know why I, I know like I'm not. Happy. You know why I know I'm not going to like this movie. Why? Because because uh, you think that that uh, that uh, shoot. What's the name of the one that it's? There's a film. There were two like superhero ish movies that came out same year. Uh, Kick Ass and then the other one. I can't Scott remember the Pilgrim. other one. Scott Pilgrim. You think Scott Pilgrim's a better movie than 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 uh, Kick Ass? Oh no 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 no. It's I, I don't think it's a better movie. I just think I like it a lot better. Oh okay. See, and it's like I, it's like I know that Citizen Kane is a much better film than Lord of the Rings. However, Lord of the Rings, I like it a lot yes. more. You know what I mean? Okay, I hear you. But I. Yeah think, like, I need some theme in my film. You know what I mean? And I need I a good it's solid... Got, I think it's got theme. I just don't think that it's, like... I think that literally, like, here's this here's this blank slate, which is this robot, which is the first robot with artificial intelligence. And 
certain people in its life are trying to teach it one thing, certain people in its life are trying to teach it another thing, and certain people in its life are trying to teach it another thing, and by the end of the film, you don't know which one was right. And the robot kind of just says, well, fuck all of you, I'm going to go off in this direction because that's what I think oh, is right. Spoiler. And, well, I, I don't know. It's like, it's not, that's the most, that's as general as I can say. Some people are good, some people are bad, and the, the hero uh, doesn't agree with any of the other people. Like, I don't know how much more general I can get, I don't know. I think it's a great film. Um, I think uh, I, I was disappointed with Blomkamp after Elysium. I am fully back on the Blomkamp bandwagon. Interesting. Now. So you like this better than Elysium? Huh. Oh, mo much better than Elysium. Wow. Yes. Yeah. Mo much okay. better. Okay. So I, I I think I'm done with robots. Um, <laughs> Get the fuck out. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I have things to say. Um, I actually want to talk about reality television. I know we don't talk about it a lot here, but um, I have recently started listening to the podcast of uh, Jay and Tony, uh, the Jay and Tony show. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, Jay and Tony are uh, reality television producers or creator. They 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 like literally have sold like half the shows in the world to networks. Um, that's that's a really specific <laughs> figure Super there. Specific. So they are um, Satan. They are Satan, basically, combined. No! They're they are to blame. Because, see, <laughs> as a host, I'm thinking no. Um, but, yeah, sure. Um, anyway, so I just listened to um, a, a really great podcast about how to get your reality TV show sold. So if you have an idea, like how to get it sold, that kind of thing, um, and it's it's really interesting, and I think a lot of the the ideas can be moved over, can be kind of brought over to scripted. Um, first of all, they're talking about it's like it's just that pitching is an art. If you're pitching something as one, um, it's basically you have to have a great sizzle reel um, or a star attached. I mean, like, I get it with scripted, you can have a really great script, but if you have someone attached, that's automatically going to be visibility, that's going to be money, that's going to be money coming in, um, or just a really great sizzle. Otherwise, apparently, according to them, like, nobody cares. Um, and if you're going to pitch, like, if you're going into the room, interestingly enough, bringing said star into the room with you, not a good idea. A lot of stars are not very good pitchers. It makes total so, sense to me. Yeah, and, and a lot of, especially uh, actors, tend to be very different, sometimes can be very different on camera than they are in person. Um, so, you know, don't bring Lindsay Lohan with you to pitch your next feature, because she's probably be bring strung her to out. A, bring her to your next drug deal, but don't yeah. bring her to your... I wouldn't, I wouldn't bring Lindsay Lohan with me, and full stop. <laughs> <laughs> the end. Um, anyway, it was, it was tons of info about, like, creating and pitching, creating a good sizzle, and, like, pitching, like, you know, you can, it, with, if, you, if you're creating something just to pitch it to potential investors, you can download the soundtrack to, like, far and away. You can steal crap from YouTube, because it's not going to see the light of day, right? You don't have to have any rights for anything. It doesn't matter, because it's just a sizzle, and you're just using it to pitch, which I found in String and automatically, immediately downloaded the soundtrack to Far and Away because I was like, oh, I love Far and Away. And that, you know, the average sizzle should be less than three minutes. Whatever you do, don't pitch while you're actually showing the sizzle if you're in the room, you know what I mean? Let them actually watch it. And, um, and you should be able to, you know, the elevator pitch, you should be able to pitch in three sentences. Anyway, anyway, it was really interesting. Um, it's... Uh, it's the yeah, it's an interesting podcast, and I feel like I'm learning a lot more about scripted stuff um, from reality stuff too. That's awesome. I got to uh, on, on, specifically on that scissor reel on that scissor reel thing, um, and and using copyrighted material for that. I I first got exposed to that. I worked for this director for um, a couple of months years ago. Um, he probably totally doesn't remember me. And the guy's done some like he's 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 done some some Hollywood films, he's not whatever. Um, but uh, he had a whole project going on while I was there. He was pitching a film, obviously I'm not going to I'm not gonna say too much about it, but it was a film based on a video game that was basically the last video game you'd ever expect to be made into a film. And, um, and he had this idea... Yeah. What? Mist... No. no. Uh, he had that dude Mist would probably make a great film. Um, he had this idea for 
for uh, how to turn it into a a movie. Androids. No, and he no. edited. He his his pitch for it was he edited a trailer for the film out of existing Roger. films. Nope. And he used he used uh, footage from movies like The Island, that Ewan McGregor movie, a bunch of K-pop, like uh, uh, Korean films that I'd never seen before, a whole bunch of, and he he had music from fucking everything. He had music from The English Patient and like Star Wars and fucking Indiana Jones. Like it was, but the trailer totally came together. It didn't feel disjointed. You were like, I'm seeing all of these things from all of these different movies, but he picked all of these elements that completely worked with each other. It was it it was very, very interesting, but after watching the trailer, I was like, dude, if you could make a movie that fulfilled the promise of that trailer, absolutely I would go and watch that. And talk about cost room. efficient, you know what I mean? Like there's yeah. little to no <laughs> cost for that. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So that reminds me of that that uh, have you ever seen the trailer of The Shining that was edited together to make it look like a romantic comedy? Yes. Yes. Hilarious. <laughs> so they do fantastic. that all the time. They have Game of Thrones as a romantic comedy. They've mm -hmm. got uh, they've got um what do you call it? They've got Scream as like a teen as a as a teen sex comedy because you know you got the teens <laughs> you got the sex but it's like do 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 like the guy with the yeah. mask is like chasing the girl through the field do 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 and she's like da 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 da. <laughs> Amazing. All right. Uh, yeah. Since we were talking about reality TV, I'm I have absolutely nothing to say about it. So I will continue, if I may, with actually what I thought was kind of the coolest thing. But whatever, it's last. So there you have it. Save um, the best for last. Save the best for last. So since we didn't have a show last week, we obviously did not get a chance to discuss what I think is the biggest news from last week, which was the announcement at the Apple event on the 9th of March, that HBO will be available starting in April exclusively on Apple products on their brand new HBO Now platform for only $14.99 a month. So I win. I made a bet. Well, I guess nobody because nobody took me up on it, but whatever. Anyway, I made a bet last year with nobody that this day would be coming within the year, and I, it was like in October, I think. I can't remember when I did it. So I win. Not only that... But that is big news, although I don't know if I want to move That's on huge news. past That's it. That's awesome. That is huge news. But but not only that, but I didn't even know this. Apparently... Before, sorry, uh, I'm so sorry. Before you get into that second part, do we have a fucking date yet? I've been looking for the HBO Go a la carte. April. Just April. Just April. I mean, it's guarantee you'll away. see it. They need yeah. to give me a date. Some, I guarantee you sometime in April, it will appear in everywhere. It will you know what it's going to be? You know what it's going to well, be? It's going to be it's... two days after the release of Game of Thrones. Because people are going to be sitting there. People who don't have cable are going to be sitting there going, ah, ah, and then HBO is going to be like, hey, you can totally get a la carte. And people are like, shut up and take my money. Take it. Take it. Take it. I doubt it will be. I think they'll do it at the same on the same day. When does it start again? April uh, what? Uh, I don't remember. It'd be Ooh, stupid It's for like them early. It's like 6th or 7th, right? I bet. I bet that's when. In fact, I didn't know that it was... I didn't know that... I don't really watch the show, but... Uh, so I didn't know any of the timing of it. But anyway, April yeah, 8th. that's... It's April 8th. I guarantee uh, you it'll be then. It'll be the same time so that people can get it oh. at the same time. I guarantee. Because then, yeah, they're going to be getting all the money at that point. But people are going to be... Anyway, wait. Let me move on to the next part because this Do is it. actually interesting. I didn't know about this. How this slipped past my radar, I have no idea. But one of our members, Steve Brock, was telling me on Wednesday about this thing called... Um, What's it called? It's called uh, Sling TV, and uh, it's actually a product from Dish, from the Dish Network. They actually announced it at CES in January. I had no idea until friggin' Steve Brock tells me about it. He shows it to me on his friggin' Windows phone. It's only 20 bucks a month. You go to Sling TV, uh, just sling.com or sling.tv. It'll both take. It'll take you to the same place, um, and for only 20 bucks a month. You get like a basic offering of a lot of channels. I think it was like it started off. I think it was twelve, but I think it's built up to like fifteen or or so. Um, and guess what's included on it? ESPN and ESPN two. You also uh, get 
What's that sound? Was that? I don't care about sports, but that like for sports people, yes. that is huge. Yes. Sports huge. is like the huge. last yeah. thing yep. that people yep. are That's like. It. Well, that'll always be on this TV. This is the end. This is the end. Nope. Yeah. Anyway, you also get Disney, Adult Swim, Cartoon Network, CNN, TNT, El Rey, AMC, IFC, you get a bunch of others mm -hmm. like Home Garden and stuff like that, and it's only twenty bucks a month, and so you can drop your cable and get all these channels if you like these channels, and then there are also a bunch of extra sort of five dollar a month add that you can get, like Kid Extra that gives you some extra children's channels and Sports Extra and Hollywood Extra. What, uh, and, and so it's here. The day is here. Ba Dish Network basically opened it up and now there are a lot of channels that are, that, are, that are basically available as an alternative to cable. So cable is dead. Cable is now an ISP. <laughs> Here's the thing, which is crazy about this, which I think is good for businesses and good for consumers. It's awesome. If you get the basic package and all the extras, all the extras, everything that yeah. you'd normally get on cable, if you got it all, you are going to wind up paying the same, probably a little bit more, as you do for cable right now. But you don't have to do that anymore. Right, right. You can get Cartoon Network and ESPN and CNN because that's what you watch. Why yeah. did we ever think it was okay to pay 150 or whatever dollars per month for cable when you only watch like four or five channels out of it? It's insane. Well, because we didn't have the options. Yeah, yeah of the, course, of course. Obviously, but you're like, like, dude, I want ESPN. I got to pay 50 more bucks a month and then I get all this other stuff. Yeah. So people are just going to make jokes about how ridiculous it was. In the future, people are going to make jokes about, like, you know, like, yeah. I mean, I, they kind yeah. of already do, about how stupid it was and is. Anyway. I'm signing up for Sling TV right now. Like, do as, it. We, <laughs> as we do Michelle, it. Michelle, you have, have, something, something, to do you have something to talk about, but you want to make it up as you go along, right? I do. I like to, I actually have a lot to say about this. Um, improv. Um, let's talk improv. Um, as an actor, um, improv to me is the most terrifying thing in the world. <laughs> it's going to be a monologue. <laughs> what? I'm just saying, as an as, as a as a as a writer director, to me, improv is the most terrifying thing in the world. <laughs> I, I it's actually happened, it's happening. So here's what here's what I have to say about it: is it's like such a trend now in TV. Yeah, improv is. Everything in like multicam comedies. Um, our fabulous um, Patrick Duncan. I was talking to him the other day. One of the members of our we make movies we make movies community um, shot an episode of Parks and Rec, and he was he's part of our um, part of our improv. He shows up to all of our improv nights. He was great at it. He does a good job. I'm like ah, so no way. I'm scared of improv. Um, but he was on set doing whatever his role was in in. Um, and Tina Fey just started improving. She started, you know, shooting the shit. Why not? Blah, 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 blah. And he just kind of obviously was prepared and it was great. But um, this is happening so, so much in multicam. I have been, I can't even tell you how many auditions I've been in recently where I'll go in and then they'll be like, great, you do your lines. And they go like, great, um, so do you do improv? And if you are not at like Groundlings or you know any of the improv teams around the around town, they're just like done. Literally, a yeah. super fun night. I went in for a super fun night last year, back when it was actually still happening. That Rebel Wilson comedy, um, and it was just for like a one of some like you know bitchy girlfriend. And I went in, and they're like, "Great, so do you improv?" And I was like, "I mean, not really." And they're like, "Great, thanks, bye." Yeah. Like, Whoa! Shut down. Um, and I was so I was shot a little it, film. It wasn't a film. It was a, a book trailer. Um, a really expensive book trailer last weekend. And the director, I showed up and I had gotten the shot list. No script. She's like, "There's no script. It's just you know, it's just." I thought it was going to be voiceover <laughs> over me, you know, doing stuff. Right? Like, here's Michelle driving in the car. Here's Michelle cowering from her boyfriend brandishing a gun, you know, that kind of thing. No, I show up on set, she's like, so, just like improv what you would say. What? See, yeah. See, but, so, listen, like, let me be clear, let me be clear, I'm not afraid of improv. I did, I did plenty of improv when I first started acting. Actually, I started doing 
with improv and stage combat. I just did it in New York City and blah blah. blah. And I'm not. I'm just. My point is, is it's great. It's a lot of fun when you're an actor, but I'm not an actor anymore. I quit acting a, a while ago. So it, it's not. It doesn't interest me as a writer. It doesn't interest me as a director. That's that's the thing. It's like a part of my life that I don't really. And going out to watch improv to me is it's all right, but I'd prefer a an actual stand-up comic. That's that's my thing. But I can see from that type of stuff how it's important. I'm just yeah, not, for, that's just not the type of director I am. For know? comedy and comedy shows, like New Girl is just ch chock full of improv. And I love it. I, th I think New Girl's great. I think it's a great sitcom, great show, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. And, and I can totally see, because so many shows, especially comedy shows, are started by comedians and comedic actors, and they love improv. And why wouldn't they? It's fun. It can be very fun. Um, I do... I do take issue with the whole thing of, I mean, I, I really don't want to insult anybody, but I do take issue with the whole thing of like, okay, so we're going to make a movie and like, here's the script and like the script yeah. isn't a script. Yeah, it's right, a right. series of scenes and the dialogue is actors improv the dialogue. And that it, seems... That seems to yeah. me like a lazy method of filmmaking. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with improv. I don't want to say like I, I I invite improv and if actors are like can can we just like try the scene da da da. I'm like as long as you're gonna do it the way that I that I wrote it as well, you can do you can do anything and some great ideas come out of it and everything like that. Um, and I but love. Also, I don't think it's as funny. I don't think it ends up as funny if you don't if you don't go into it with a number. I mean, yes, if you have a ton of hilarious jokes already in the script, you already right. if if some of them don't pan out and somebody says something that's funnier on set, you know what I right. mean? It's gonna it's gonna get better that way. But if Absolutely. you got no script, you're gonna have a crappy film. Just. But it's becoming more and more popular, and and my concern is that like. Well, so is reality writer. television. Right, but I mean, so writers are going to start losing even more jobs because I I was at a talk back or a, a Q and A at the um, LA Film Fest for a feature, a, a, a pretty a, an interesting like post apocalyptic feature um, that they had talked to the director and the director was like, yeah, the the film was completely improv. Yeah, we yeah. just hung out together and kind of figured out what we were doing and then and I'm like, that made it to LA Film Fest? Yeah. What? A lot That's of crap. Ridiculous. Gets, and, there's a book by this guy, Peter Sh Peter Schaefer. No, maybe not Peter Schaefer. Anyway, he was one of the, the main guys over at the Royal Shakespearean Company. Wrote a book called The Empty Space. And one of the chapters, and it, each one is about a different space, like a different type of theater, rather. And so one of them is called Dangerous Theater. And it's basically, a whole chapter is about bad theater and how people... Sometimes it just, for whatever reason, people think it's amazing. And he's like, don't ever forget that bad is just bad. And it doesn't matter how many people like it. If it's bad, you can have that. You can hold, you know, you can hold that opinion true to yourself and just be like, all right, everybody else seems to go crazy about it. But this is bad. And I'm just going to know that. Yeah, in my opinion, the worst, uh, the worst the Iron Man films, for example, is Iron Man 2. That script, 70% improv. And they said that they were like, we just went in and like figured out a lot of the scenes, da, 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 da. and this is like a what, which is what. <laughs> however, somebody wants to make a movie, I'm never going to say that it's a wrong way to make a movie. However, where I do, um, as a writer and director, where I do take issue is when actors show up and they're like, and and they don't see the need to memorize lines because they're just going to get the general idea of what they're supposed to say and then make it up on the spot. And I've had that happen on two different projects and I'm just like, yep. no. Yeah, no. no. Fortunately, fortunately, not on the projects by the time it was happening, but like in the introductory phases, either some, in one case, somebody that I did end up hiring on the condition that like, no motherfucker, like memorize your lines. And another one where the person was like, I prefer working this way. And I was like, I, I do not want to work that way. And they were like, <laughs> I only really like working that way. I was like, Bye. Like no, <laughs> not not, not doing that. that. Ugh, that's so ridiculous. Yeah. We but it's like, oh well, that's what people are doing nowadays, man. It's like cool. Not these people. Not these. Yeah. Go join them. <laughs> Go work with hey, them. Hey Garrett, looks yes. like you're gonna freestyle. I am. I am gonna. Uh, I'm gonna calling each other out. Improv? I know. Uh, no, not you. exactly improv. Uh, <laughs> there's a difference between. There's a difference between a talk show and talking off the cuff and uh, and and improving. I just want to point out the fact that somebody came completely prepared to this.
particular show. Yes, you did. But, oh, but I, I, really? I've been up all night and I spent all morning crying, and that's my excuse. Star. No, I just finished producing, and by producing I mean editing and formatting and, and helping publish a book for this nonfiction author. Uh, and the the book is called uh, the the Audience Revolution, and there was a lot. I mean, obviously I edited it and I formatted it, so I've I've read it through a couple of different times now. There's some really good ideas in there for content creators, and a, it, it's one of those books where um, a lot of the things. A, a, not all of them, but a lot of the things that he says are 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 seemingly self-evident, but you don't you don't think of them until they're clarified and codified. You know what I mean? In general, it goes into the concept of always, always, always putting your audience first. Now, it's really when I first saw it and I first started reading the premise of the book and actually reading the book, I was like, okay, but you can't you can't like just do whatever people tell you to do because then you're not actually originally creating art or content or whatever right but it's not but but what i sort of like realized as i was as reading through the book was it's it's audience first it's not audience only mm. and it's just a philosophy of basically having your audience knowing who your audience is and being in constant communication with them looking for what they want or need next. They don't always know what they want or need next, but if you're an intelligent person, you can actually glean that. Now, if you're an educator, for example, I do a lot of, of non-fiction, non-narrative stuff on educating people on self-publishing. Uh, because I'm a self-published author, I'm pretty good at what I do, so people are like, how do you do blah? Perfect example of how to do that in, in, in that specific sphere. People ask me all the time, how do you do X function? And more people ask me how to publish a book to Kindle than any other thing that they ask me for. Obviously, the next thing that I should teach people and make a YouTube video about how to publish a book to Kindle. And so I made a YouTube video you know, just the other day about that because so many people are asking that. And it's in, in terms of being a, a, a creator, like an independent artist and whatever, for me as a, as a, as a writer... Um, what is the next book that people are like want me to write more than anything else? Like I wrote, you know, my Realm Keeper series and then my Nightblade series, and now more people are asking me about my Nightblade series than my Realm Keeper series. So let's prioritize Nightblade. And then when people get a little bit louder about Realm Keepers, then we go back to that. And obviously, you have to jockey what you want to do and can do with what people want. But I don't think that people pay enough attention to what their audience wants. And I think that the people who do pay that at level of attention are the ones who tend to find success more quickly. You know, you'll also you'll often see YouTube creators, YouTube uh, uh, ch channel hosts and everything like that who constantly invite dialogue and contribution from their audience on like what type of videos do you like to see? What did you like about this? What a da 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 da. All the big and successful ones do that, and I feel like people who are just like, I'm going to make a video about this today. Like, obviously, sometimes you always have to do that, but I feel like people who who put that audience first as a priority on their on their philosophy are going to tend to please their audience a lot more. So that was that's what I've been thinking about this week. You're a pleaser. I am a pleaser. You're an a audience pleaser. pleaser. I am. Yeah. I, you know, I will do whatever it takes to please my audience. Ladies, let me ask you a question. Now, has that been, has that helped you grow your audience much? That process? Well, it's been it's been four days since I've been working on this book. So far, not a whole lot of growth. No, but but, but <laughs> no, but some of the stuff you were talking about is stuff you've been doing for a while. No, well, I, well, I mean, it's all stuff that I have been doing for a while. But like, I didn't you don't feel like you've been doing it to the exactly. Degree. Like I wasn't I going that. about it with that viewpoint. I made that video I on see. Friday, how to publish a book on Kindle. It's 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 getting views very very quickly because people obviously want to know how to publish a book on Kindle. I mean, it's only but it's literally two days old, you know. Yeah. So. Well, the reason why I'm asking is because oh hello, good at that. <laughs> what? The reason why I'm asking is that. Um, when I look at our like our uh, our analytics, and I look at our analytics a lot, not just on the website, but for the podcast and whatnot. Yeah. And Sam Sam Messman has a very big following. He's got um, he's got his following is uh, sorry. I was like I'm playing with my <laughs> with my Sling TV because I wanted to give like an instant review. Um, the uh, playing with himself. 
Uh, the yeah. he, it's his immediately when he hit the. Now, mind you, he was able to get on some pretty big guests, but right away he had kind of a huge following, and his following. And by huge, I'm not saying like in the tens and hundreds of thousands, but I'm talking like 30 to 40 times what this podcast gets, what uh, what How We Make Movies gets. And a big part of it is that he is kind of a, uh, he's a known quantity in the Final Cut Pro X world. For a right. while he's been, you know, uh, Apple started hiring him. I don't think I can say this, but <laughs> but I don't know. <laughs> I'm just gonna because nobody watches this anyway. It's the anonymity of <laughs> <laughs> it's what is it? The security of anonymity. I don't know what the heck I'm gonna call. It. Anyway, it's um he you know he's kind of a luminary in that world, and so he uh, because of it uh, he, he his following went with him immediately. So my question is, I know you also have the podcast, the storytelling podcast, and stuff like that. So I thought I already thought that to some degree you were doing some of these things that this book that you're talking about is saying, is suggesting people do. Well, that's but, the thing is is that I think I've spent too much time trying to determine for myself what what like going product first. You know what I mean? What could I make? that that I could sell the crap out of? What book could I write that I could just sell the crap out of? Rather than going, especially on nonfiction, but also in my fiction, rather than just going, what are you guys trying to learn? Or what kind of book mm. do you guys like reading? Like, I have an email list. I have fans on Facebook and YouTube subscribers. And I can mm. just go, what do you like? What are some of your favorite books? What are some of your favorite videos? What mm. um, in, in for for other self-published authors? Go to porn. Me, you future know? reference. Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, oh, you are. You, well, I'll I'll Just send go you that porn. link later. Just go to porn. Excellent. I'll send you the link to that website of mine later. That's a that's a new project, but I think we've got some stuff that's going to be right up your alley. Wonderful. <laughs> really. <laughs> it's that was the wrong sound effect. It should have been getting. <laughs> That's there there you go. So, uh, rim job. No, rim shot. Sorry, that's what I meant to say. Oh, anyway, it's, um, a, it's an interesting oh. philosophy, and if you are an online creator, especially if you're trying to build yourself up as an authority figure, which Sam is. Sam is unquestionably an authority figure on Final Cut. You know? Yeah. Um, how do you build yourself up to be an authority figure? Well, you provide the type of teaching and authority and knowledge that people are looking for. How do you find out what that is? You can just you can actually just ask people. So yeah. there you go. Excellent. Wunderbar. That's my lesson for the day. Uh, let's get into the community news. First of all, as always, if you're watching this on YouTube or if you are listening to us on the iTunes feed, uh, please pop over to iTunes and rate the show. Uh, we, we, we love hearing uh, your ratings and reviews, and it helps other people find the show as well. Next, this week's event is the WMM Showcase. Woo! I have no fucking clue what this is. Chad, do you want to... Uh... <laughs> Do you want to explain uh, to people? I think Michelle probably knows. Are you in it? Uh, yeah, I am, in fact. Um, it's interesting. We have a lot of very talented actors and actresses at, at We Make Movies, and um, there has come a... a um, there's we've, we've developed an evening um, where the actors uh, do scenes together, and um, We Make Movies is inviting industry people um, directors, writers, producers, agents, managers, casting directors. There's, I know um, for sure, um, well over 20 RSVP'd people, like industry people, that will be in the audience that night. Um, and be so, gentle uh, to them. Do not tear the clothing from their flesh. <laughs> So um, I think everybody's got uh, has like a, a scene, a short scene, five to seven pages that they're gonna do, largely comedy, and it'll be it'll be fun. I'm doing a little scene with um, our fabulous fabulous Patrick Duncan from Zack and Mary Make a Porno, um, and I know there's a huge age difference thing, which is, actually makes it a lot funnier. Um, but yeah, it should be a fun night, and so everyone's welcome to come, come and be supportive audience members. But this is like a it's like a we make movies show and tell for industry. Like, hey, look what we got. It's cool. I'm awesome. totally bummed that I can't make it. I was really, really, really planning on making it, but it was the only – we're shooting this next weekend. It was the only night we can have our full production meeting is Wednesday night. It sucks. Wow, but, wow. Uh, 
Yeah. I, I wonder if somebody could tape it. I'd love to see. Are you going, Garrett? Can you go? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I'll think... We'll talk after the show. We'll see if I can go. I'm, uh, dude. My brain is fried right now. It's amazing. I've been able to do the show. Um, <laughs> Things so, to know. Uh, that's people. seven. That's seven thirty p.m. Uh, this Wednesday night at the Theater Asylum in Hollywood. Uh, that is where you can go and see the first ever We Make Movies members showcase. Uh, so it should definitely be interesting. Woo! Check it out and help us figure out what it is. Finally, we have a Patreon page. We make movies. See what I did there? We make movies is the nice. only uh, completely community-supported film collective in the world, as far as we know, and we don't research it too much because we we <laughs> like being the only ones. No, seriously, we are entirely funded uh, by our community, which we think is pretty awesome, and that all happens through Patreon, where you can subscribe for a monthly amount. As a subscriber, uh, you help crowdfund all of our activities. Uh, you get special perks. You get member bonuses and benefits, especially if you come to the live events. You, you Handies. You gotta become a patron because Chad will give you handies. Um, with maybe not. Maybe not actually. Don't hold me to that. But I maybe. think you're the one doing maybe. the holding. Hey yo! <laughs> so uh, patreon.com slash we make movies is where you can become a patron and be completely and totally awesome. Uh, there was one more thing. Oh, yes, and um, since all, all of our regular activities are weekly workshops, whether it's the writer's workshop, all that sort of thing. And that's all completely funded through the community. Now, every dollar above that is going into a rolling production fund. And 70 Chad cents of every dollar is what Sorry? it means. 70 cents of every dollar. 70% of every dollar. That's you what I meant to dollar. say. Yes. And, uh, do and you want what to tell we people... are going to do is... Chad. Short film. Yay. 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 So we surveyed, we surveyed our patrons and members of the community, and we said, what do you want us to do with the rolling production fund? See, audience first. And, uh, and they said, we want to start making short films as a community. So we are now uh, doing that. We're going to save up a few grand. We're going to uh, have a community process to select the uh, short film, obviously, among the scripts submitted to us by patrons. And um, and we're going we're gonna to start making some damn movies. And it's all funded by the community. That is freaking awesome. Right? I, that's just like, that's really super amazing that we're able Irma to do that. Yeah. Yes. Irma yeah. Gerd. So uh, patreon.com slash we make movies. Absolutely. Finally, we have some things for you to know. I have the first thing for you to know. It's very exciting. Um, Michelle and I and Chad and a whole bunch of other people in We Make Movies made a little short film recently. It's called Unsaid. It is going to release today. Uh, it's going to be All over available. your face. Uh, it's going to be available on YouTube. I'm actually not sure how the submission process works because it we're not just uploading it to YouTube. Like It's going to be a thing that you can rent from YouTube, which is kind of cool. We're trying it, a YouTube distribution. We're going to see how it goes. Um, you should put it on everything. You should put it on YouTube. You should put it on Vimeo. You should put it on... You know what I mean? Paid yeah, the only thing is... price on everything. Yeah, the only thing is that, it, first of all, Google sets the price. You can suggest a price, but then they set it. So, really? Yeah. And everybody does that. Everybody does that. Uh, except for Vimeo. Vimeo, you can charge whatever you want. Amazon, you tell them, I want to charge this for this. And then they look at the length of your video and they say, well, we're going to charge this for this. So we're sort of like, eh. We're going to put it up on YouTube right now, for now. We're going to uh, then expand into branching out our distribution. This is our first time professionally distributing a film. It's my first time anyway. So uh, we're figuring it all out. Uh, hopefully the submission process will allow it to get up and online today. Um, if you want to find out how that happens, follow either Michelle or I on Twitter. I'm at Garrett Author. Uh, Michelle is at M. Lucadu. We will definitely be blasting it to the high heavens the second you're able to get that film. In the ammo. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Chad? Um, uh, sure. So, to, so my short film Tuesday morning, and uh, you may or may not notice that I don't actually ever really put my films up for free anywhere. Some of that is because uh, I try to recoup a little bit of the cost. Like Shorts TV bought, uh, got my film carefully descending um, for three years, so they paid me like a few hundred dollars for that. It was not much, but it was it made it. Uh, it it's nice to get a little bit of money back from the films that you make. Uh, so. 
uh, so Tuesday morning is now about to start a similar thing on IndieFlix. Uh, IndieFlix uh, and Shorts TV, I think, uh, might be also getting it again this year. They may set that. We'll see. They, they're, I've been in talks with them, so we'll see. But it's about to go live on IndieFlix, which is something you should know. You should go to IndieFlix.com. It can be very, I think it's like five bucks a month. Uh, if you get it like during the holidays or something, you can look for deals. I got mine a super early adopter rate at a at a dollar a month, so it's it's a really good uh, rate. Um, and then also Sling TV. While we were doing the show, I tried it out, and I there's actually a seven day trial, so that's hard to say no to. Go do it for seven days. If you don't like it, just quit after um, after you know. Uh, before seven days go, is up, and then you won't have to pay a dime. But it's only like nineteen ninety nine a month. Um, so might have freaking oh. awesome, Michelle. What Garrett said. <laughs> no, what Garrett said, unsaid. Not not unsaid. Not what Garrett unsaid, but what yeah. Garrett said. Un Hold on first. And yeah. we're gonna be uh, we're gonna be getting into like we're I'm I'm very excited about this. Um, I'll I'll definitely be talking about Unset and its distribution and how it's going in weeks to come. If the film happens to do well, expect me to uh, to tell you hold how to do pants. it. Oh. Hold, yeah, pull down my pants. Just start in up jacking it right right in front of all y'all. <laughs> and that is a perfect note to end wow. this episode of the We Make Movies Film Geeks podcast. Thank you, uh, everybody who watched live. We had a few people popping in here and there. I'm Garrett Robinson. You can find me at GarrettBRobinson.com. Chad is at SuperFrico.com. And you can find Michelle on Twitter at MLukadoo. We'll see you next Sunday, everybody. Goodbye.